Welcome back to Comic Book News. Today, we're going to talk to Brian Hibbs, a 30-year comic book retailer in San Francisco. I learned a lot of stuff from Brian over the years, and today he's going to tell us a little about his history in the past, present, and future of comics experience. We're also going to talk a little bit about our uh, mutual dear departed friend and retailing legend, Rory Root. So it gets a little bit inside baseball. This one is not for everybody, but if you're really interested in the ins and outs of comic book stores, you're not going to want to miss Brian Hibbs on Comic Book News. Brian Hibbs, welcome to Comic Book News. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to talk with us a little bit about, about you and about comics. Sure, my pleasure, Dan. Um, so, Brian, you opened Comics Experience in 1989. Correct. So that's that makes this 30, 30 years. Yeah, just slightly over 30 now, yeah. So, man, that's a long time to do anything. <laughs> but it's a really long time to run a successful comic book store. Right. Um, so, before we get into like your history and, and, and stuff, tell me a little bit about, about like during that 30 years, like what is the biggest change you've seen in the comic book retailing scene? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the most obvious change would be the way that comics and the comic shop have moved from being back issue centric to being book centric. Uh, or, or pop culture centric or whatever the other possibilities are. But certainly when I opened 30 years ago, every comic shop was a back issue store first and foremost. Yes. And everything else was layered on top of that. Um, the whole center of my store was all back issues back then. Uh, the majority of comic shops, that's what they were about was selling back issues. And and that was what made the mechanism of the periodical work, of course, right? Because if you, if you don't sell all your periodicals in the first 30 days, then you have a way that you can continue to move them through the back issue. And so, you know, I would say that the, the not the death, but the strong, 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 strong decrease in the back issue uh, is, is probably the thing that drives the way that retailers act and react more than almost anything else. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that the, um, uh, the periodical thing and the back issue things, man, they come in waves, right? It seems like we're back in another wave where back issues are ascending, if not, you know, uh, totally, but are, are, are back on the rise again, right? I'm sort of seeing that out in the, in the, in the wild. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think I think there's two different things that you can talk about. One would be um, uh, the rise of the speculator. I mean, the speculator and short term flipping of books is a huge thing right now. It's also a thing that we as a business should be avoiding in every way, shape and form because it just doesn't lead any place good. The other the other thing that happens is the high end back issue market. But in order to play in the high issue and back issue market, you have to be very capitalized. You have to have dedicated people. You need a you need a business model that's laser focused on that, and I I don't really believe that most stores are interested or capable at, at this moment in time of, of doing that. You know, certainly my other store, Outpost, is a back issue store, but it even there it's it's very it's very difficult to make that actually work profitably because of the sheer bulk of of non-commercial things you have to carry in order to get a reputation and, and a size of a business large enough to to carry the higher end stuff not to mention the storage costs the labor costs sure. the sure. constant repricing the keeping sure. up with the sure. speculation I, sure i've come i've come a, like i shopped at your store when i lived in san francisco a lot i shopped at all the stores right sure. And the one thing I noticed, I think you, when I was shopping at your store was after you had made the transition, like the back issue bins were shrinking and, and, and decreasing. And that was obvious in the industry. I, I really think the back issue thing was the opportunity that allowed for the creation of the great, uh, of the, of the direct market, right? It was the, it was the lack of availability of anything on the newsstand and just the 
complete lack of desire for back stuff that created that in used bookstores and led to the rise of the DM. Mm -hmm. um, and then with the rise now, so, so to me, it's been all about windowing. Like the entire comics industry from then till now, release and availability and window of availability seems to be like a driving factor for the business model of selling comics, if, if that makes sense to you at all, right? Like, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, it, it is, um, it is, but I don't know, I don't know in today's pop culture world that it's as necessary as it was, you know? Well, I think that the, <coughs> that the windowing, I mean, it's so common <coughs> in other media, right? Like your TV show is played on TV once a week, with commercials, you get the most money for it. And then, you know, it sure. goes to DVD and then it goes to syndication and then sure. it goes to whatever. Sure. And I see that in comics is that once the, once the graphic novel was accepted, not as a, an inferior reprint that reduced collectability, sure. um, that, that is. right. That then that knowledge of, well, I mean, there's a whole collectible angle on the book end too that I never saw come in the graphic novel end. Yeah. Um, but that windowing now, it's like, nobody has seems to have like taken that as seriously and consistently as in other media. There's such a weird disconnect to me between the scheduled release of collective material and comics material, especially from the big players. Image seems to get it. A small guy seems to get it. Like they put out their comics for a certain window, boom, trade paperback. And then that becomes the vehicle for sales over sure. the long haul. Sure. And I just am not seeing it as consistent. Like it's not, not what, what books are going to come out as hard covers? What books are going to come out as soft covers? What books are going to take a year? What books are going to take six months? I, if I'm a consumer of serial entertainment, it's much easier for me to get a consistent fix these days by going to the comic store every week and picking up the issues. Like it's, sure. it's, it's dribs and drabs, but mm -hmm. it's feeding me, right? It's feeding that mm -hmm. addiction. Mm -hmm. and, and so now that we, we, when you shatter that window, if you will, and now people are used to waiting for the trade, no matter how long that takes. And if it takes a year, you might forget about it. It's just right. changed the whole way that comics are sold and thought about and collected by the general public. As, well, as sure. Well as I mean, public. and this is a thing I've been talking about for a long time. I mean, I, I think it is, I think it's actually extraordinarily foolish that Marvel and DC in particular made it a policy that absolutely every single thing that they publish gets reprinted in a book format because because that's what led to waiting for the trade. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember back in the day where it was a 20% chance maybe that any particular storyline would if actually that. get collected, if that, right? You know, there were some, you know, you, you probably knew that Camelot 3000 or Dark Knight was going to get, well, not Dark Knight at the time, but you know what I mean? Like, it's a, if, it's a, if it's a big story, you know that book's going to get collected. But, um, you know, the idea that any random issues of Spectacular Spider-Man are going to be bound together in a book uh, I think really poisons the well, um, both for the periodical and also for the book format, because it, it devalues the book format when you have way too many SKUs. The, the problem right now in the book world, uh, I think, you know, as a bookstore predominantly, is there are way, 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 way too many graphic novels. It's not possible to carry them all, not in a profitable way. Nobody has infinite rack space to do that. And where are you going with that? What are you doing with that? I mean, I, I think being a lot more stringent on uh, on putting out book format comics would have been a great idea. And I mean, obviously that that horse is out of the, the barn now, but. Uh, well, that's hilarious because like you, when I think of your stores, you're a bookstore. Sure. Right. And so, and I remember when I started my, when I bought my store back in 2000 or whatever, it was just coming into Main Street. You'd been doing it for a long time. Other stores in the Bay Area that I learned from had, you know, they saw, they, you guys clearly saw the book as the future. And sure. for me back then, I would be like, man, I wish everything was collected like six months mm -hmm. to the dot and came out. And then, and, but then you have to keep those things in print if people want back yep. issues, right? And it be, yep. just becomes another form of periodical in many ways. Yep. In many ways. Yeah. Yeah. And not everything deserves a permanent form too. 
you know? I mean, that's, that's the thing. Uh, you know, what do we always say? Be careful what you wish for, you may get it. So, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always have been a, a big booster of the book format, but I like anything else in the comic industry, when you have a good thing, certain people take it way, 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 way yeah. too far. Yes. So, I mean, I was one of those guys that was like, the floppy's gone. Back issues are for suckers. These right. flop, these pamphlets are going to go away, and I'm going to yeah. be a bookstore eventually. Right. It never happened to it me. Happened. Yeah. It didn't happen to the industry. Sure. I don't think it's going to happen to the industry, short of a complete collapse of the direct market and periodicals in general. But which even, is all even, possible. but even then, it still probably wouldn't work. I, I. Yeah. If I didn't have periodicals driving foot traffic in my store, I don't know that there's enough. I mean, well, no, there are enough book releases. I just, it's not the way people shop, right? Like a lot of times we make decisions either based on, on our projection of what we think customers do or our aspirational nature. The, the, the way that we think that, oh, comics revolve around Wednesdays and the Wednesday warrior, right? But when I actually analyzed my sales, I went and analyzed a year's worth of sales, actually two years worth of sales, because I wanted a big enough window. And, and what I found was when you know, people who come in once a week is a significant percentage of my business, right? It's about a third of my business. But there's also a third of my business that comes in once every one or two months. That's about another third. And then there's a final third of my business that comes in like maybe twice a year, three times a year. So, I love that analysis. And that's not an analysis that I don't think that most stores have even slightly thought of because what they do is they look and they see Wednesday is bustling. Of course. Oh, therefore, Wednesday, that's what our business is. We should build around that. Yes. But but when I pulled back and looked at the data, I, I saw that it wasn't true. And that made me reassess a few of the things that we do in the store and the way we rack things and how we do it and what square footage we're giving over to this and what we're giving over to that. And, and when I make arguments to the publishers about, I think this is the best way to, you know, to publish, which is something we all do, obviously, uh, it's very much informed by that knowledge that a third of my customers come here you know, three times a year. At most. I'd really be interested to know numerically, I don't know if you have the breakdown, when you say a third of your customers, is that in dollars or is that in bodies? That's in dollars. Right. That's in dollars. It, it's the easy way to do the math. Of course, of um, course. I mean, I did, I, did count, I did count unique visitors. What I did is I, so actually it is bodies when I think about it. No, no, it is bodies. This was, this was like a okay. year ago. So that's why I have okay. to, wait a minute, what was that? Yeah, no, it was bodies because the way, I, the way I did it was I was looking for the customers who come in weekly. You identify them and you go, this is this number of customers. Yeah, so it's a third, a third, a third in terms of bodies. Yes, exactly. That's very interesting. And then yeah. I would like to know how that contrasts to the dollar breakdown. Yeah, um, so obviously, obviously people who come in more frequently tend to spend slightly more money. I, I don't have the data in front of me. My memory was is that they, the numbers were, it, the, the, the weekly people spent more, but not preposterously more. It was right. like 10 or 15% more. Sure. You know? and, and the fact is for a Wednesday guy, and I am a Wednesday guy since I was a kid, right? Sure. So, you know, you could throw the comics in a dumpster in the back and I'm there on Wednesday, yeah. right? Sure. Like sure. I'm rifling. Sure. Um, so to me, the lesson I learned when I looked at all the stores in the Bay Area, and I looked at yours in particular, uh, and, I, and I said, of all the stores I see around, the one that looks to me like the most civilian friendly, and the one that just seems, I, I don't want this to be a, seem like a backhanded insult, but like the repeatable, like someone could do that. Someone could look at comics experience and understand your formula tweak it a little bit or whatever for their local market because obviously san francisco is not sure, sure. it's even humongously different from san jose is what i found out sure. you know when i tried to open a hibs mm -hmm. comic relief comics experience style store with that kind of stock it just didn't work as well it right. didn't the mix was different sure um 
so I found that stuff really, really fascinating. Uh, just looking at all the different types and, and different abilities, uh, saying that I want to, if I know that I have this core group of Wednesday people, I'm probably not going to lose them. I have to do a lot to lose those people. So I need to out, I need to reach out to that other, to those other people, those two thirds of the people. And that's where I saw tremendous growth in my store, community outreach, parents coming in and, and now being excited instead of it being that place they were kind of afraid to take their kids into. It was like, this is a reward for my child. And I understand that the child is getting a lot out of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, talk to me about Scholastic. Talk to me about kids comics in general and your thoughts on how that's going to change the comic reading um, market, if you will, going forwards. Cause I've read some of your stuff about this. Sure. I mean, I think, I think the, the main thing I would say is that it's, it's kind of a generational thing, right? Like each, each group of people make comics that are a reflection of what they read when they were kids. Right. So so 10 or 15 years ago or whatever it was, uh, you know, we had the, the manga revolution and all the kids were reading manga. And now those kids have grown up and they've become Raina Telgemeier, et cetera. And they're doing comics that are what they read as a kid. They're not doing superhero comics, right? Because they didn't read superhero comics. Their, their tradition is a different one. And so... You know, the thing that I find the most sort of aspirationally exciting is that all of the kids growing up today reading, you know, Raina and well, and just, and this whole group, this whole cohort of graphic novelists who are, who are talking about real things in it, but they're using comics to do it. And, and when those kids grow up 15 years from now, boy, are we going to get some motherfucking great comics out of these guys. I, I'm, I'm so excited about what the possibilities for 10 years down the line look like, uh, just in terms of content and craft. I, I think it's going to blow all of our minds. I think it's going to make I, I can't, today I could look not insane. agree more. Yeah. In, in a way, it's almost like Harvey Picard, like, like it, we're, we're breeding a new generation of Harvey Picard who can yeah. write comics that just talk about anything, right? Yeah. And that manga influence as well, where they're willing to write comics about businessmen and basketball and what it doesn't really matter. It's mm -hmm. the art form and the medium that, that, that is so compelling. Mm -hmm. I really feel mm -hmm. like that happened um, thanks to, in part, Scholastic, in part, the new generation of librarians. That, That's the one. Librarians and teachers. Comics, it's, right? it's librarians and teachers. I mean, I, I have to say... You know, there's there's only so much that that us you know uh, uh, bearded men sitting in comic shops can do to convince people that you know uh, comics are a valid medium. Uh, it it really took the librarians and teachers, you know, going well breaking with the tradition because you, know, you know. So obviously, the thing to remember in in America about all things always is that we're a puritanical culture, and 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 we we frequently eat ourselves. Uh, and you know, if you if you go back to the 1950s and the Senate hearings on on the corruption of children, that comic books, and then the industry decided to self censor, and then we lost like two generations of creativity, basically, except on the margins, you know, the undergrounds, the ECs, but it was the margins, you know, uh, and it made society think that comics were for idiots, right? I, I remember, you know, vividly seeing movies in the 80s. And if you wanted to show that the, that the lead character was a subliterate moron, the fastest way to do it was to show them with a comic book rolled up in their sure. back pocket. You know, sure. that was code, you know. Uh, and you don't have that anymore, you know. Um, I don't think, for the most part. So, so a big chunk of it is, is teachers. I actually got to put another, another chunk of it is on direct market comic shops because because we enabled a group of people to, to embrace their love of superheroes and their love of geeky shit. And then those guys grew up and all got jobs in Hollywood and then ended up making Avengers movies. Um, you know, I don't think those Avengers movies and, and that transformation would have happened if it wasn't for comic shops. Um, so the, we countervailing cultural forces have made it 
this fantastic moment for comics. You know, I, I sit, the front door is right there. It's like two feet from me. So I always hear people talking as they walk down the street. And it used to be that people would walk down the street and it'd be like, oh, comics. Do they still make those? And now it's, oh my God, it's comics. Let's go in. Let's check that out. You know, and so there's been this just transformation, which is utterly fascinating to me. Um, it's amazing to me that they made a leap, not on just on two fronts. I mean, I made a prediction when I bought my store that the Spider-Man movie was coming out. And I said, I think superheroes and comics are going to eat the movies yeah. the way they ate the comics industry. Yeah. And I don't know if I really even believed it myself right. as much as like we've seen it happen now, where it is literally the driving force of the biggest entertainment industry on earth. Sure. But at the same time, uh, we've never had more literary appreciation of comics, sure. right? So it's almost the perfect storm. Yep. You couldn't get much better than like complete wide mainstream attention and uh, uh, literary acceptance, right? Yep. And, 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 and the fact that comics were not subliterate in any way, they were another form. That, that's just been accepted. That's just dogma. Yep. Anybody yep. now who says otherwise just seems hopelessly out of touch. Sure. We're um, trying to pick a fight. You know, there's, there's a whole lot of people who are trying to pick the fights. True, especially, especially on the, the internet. Bill Maher yeah. and those guys. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, okay, Brian. So you and I are in step there. Like, we, you, you saw it. You inspired me in many ways in, in that way. Like, just understanding that comics were a medium and not just a genre and that you could expand beyond superheroes. And there was this huge swath of people that were not being served by the superhero market. Sure, and, and who aren't interested in superheroes except maybe tangentially. That's the thing, you know? I, uh, it, you just said that, that the movie's pop culture is driving the superhero thing. That's not what civilians walking in the door are buying, though, for the most True. part. You know, they're buying everything else. They're buying the media, uh, which I find utterly fascinating. I mean, I think there's two reasons for that. One because now you can just turn on your television and there's 200 hours of superhero content there just for you just to watch for free, you know, assuming you have Netflix or something. Um, that really, you know, if you can see the Flash running on your screen, that's probably better than a Flash comic. It, it, it probably is. Um, you know, but the other part of it is, what is the other part? I actually lost my train of thought, so. Well, I mean... The idea, that, though, the idea that we are, the cultural acceptance is there, right? But there's still a, there's still a struggle. Like, there's a retail struggle in general, comic sure. stores aside, right? Retailing is taking a hit. And you can blame Amazon, you can blame the internet, you can blame traffic. There's so many factors to that. Um, but there's also, there's another squeeze going on. And this is particularly for you in a city like San Francisco. So I always thought having a, a comic book store in San Francisco is a double-edged sword, right? In, on the one hand, you've, you're not going to find a more literate audience, more open and accepting to different points of views and different types of comics. Like San Francisco is at least a couple decades, if not more, ahead of the mainstream public in that way, I think. Sure. Um, but it's also the most expensive place in the world to live, let alone to have a retail store, let alone now to hire people and be mandated by the city what you have to pay those people. Sure. I know, that you're, I know enough about you that you're a progressive guy who thinks people probably should have a living wage, right? I, I would, yeah, I would love to. I can't pay someone a living wage, though. It's literally not possible. So this I, is I, where I, this is what yeah, I want to hear. I yeah. want to hear it from a guy who believes sure, in it, sure. but knows yeah. the reality of yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I believe in it. And I, I don't make a living wage by San Francisco standards. The only reason I can live in San Francisco is because I bought a house 25 years ago and, and so my mortgage is really, really low, you know? Um, that's the only way I can stay in San Francisco. Comparatively, even 25 years ago was pretty tough. No, I know, but I mean, I, it, it, I would have to leave if it wasn't for that, you know? Yeah. Uh, but I can't leave because I own a retail store, and so what the hell else could I possibly do? Two of them. You know, two, two, I know. But it's not like you can move, you can just pick up and move. That's so, right. Though Nancy Mechanic Comics Unlimited is apparently doing that. She's, she's moving from, uh, from Los Angeles to... Minnesota? Tennessee. Tennessee, there you go. And right near like, Chattanooga, Tennessee, yeah. I, I, I am, I'm going to be fascinated to see if that works even a little bit because I, 
I don't see how you do that. I, I don't think you can just up stakes and change. I've never been to know? their store, but I've seen enough pictures and I know them enough to know that it seems like a pretty translatable business as far as like, um, you know, it's what people would expect out of a really sure. good comic book store. So I think that they have a, a potential to do well. I know that that area, yeah. <clears throat> my former, I used to work at Chattanooga right. and it's an up and coming area, a lot sure. of tech workers, big tech corridor. A lot I'm of just saying at a point you, you end up starting from scratch again. For, oh, and, for sure. And building your, your, uh, your pull list base, you know, is, is a three to five year process, right? Like, anyway, that's not what yeah. we we're talking about. No, uh, so, so tell me so I, I unique can't, challenges. You know, I know I can't make it. I know I can't make it. And I know that basically everybody who works for me is, is only able to do so either because they have a spouse in tech who is paying their way, they live at home, they have some other hustle of some kind where this is their side hustle, you know? No, that's not their primary job. And I... And, and we pay more than minimum wage, you know? I mean, it's not as though I'm a minimum wage job. Uh, and it's not much more because, you know, the wage floor starts to get murderous at a certain point. Um, it's a well, thing so I struggle to with me, on though, a regular, regular basis. Explain to me what your, if you don't mind, what, yeah. the, what that situation is in San Francisco. Like, are you affected? Is it businesses of a certain size only that- No, happens? no, it's all, it's every, every, it's minimum wage. It's, it's minimum, everybody has to pay the minimum wage. The, Which the is minimum, what now? 15, 59, 39, one or the other. It's one of the, 15, 59, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, and then of course you've got to add taxes and everything to that. So it ends up, you know, costing the retailer 18, $19, something, something in that, you know, per hour, which is a lot of money, right? You know, because you've got a, you've got a conservatively, you know, uh, five times that to, to break even on all your other expenses, right? So then all of a sudden, you've got to be making almost $100 an hour just to stay open, right? That's hard. I mean, it's not, it's not easy, you know? Um, and we would have had, you know, I did the math. So I voted, I voted for Proposition H or E or whatever it was uh, because I did want to see the minimum wage and I wanted to see the city take a stand. But then I went, I actually did the math on my own payroll and I went, oh, that doesn't make a fucking lot of sense. It's going to cost, I don't remember what the number was now. It's like 70,000 more dollars a year, you know? And I don't have 70,000 extra dollars sitting around, you know? What? Yeah, no, no, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I also, I make about $20 an hour is about what I make, you know? Can't you just flip uh, some of those back issues from last yeah, that's, year? that's not how it works. That's not hmm. how it works. Yeah. Funny. So what we, you know, I, and I didn't think that there was an ordering you know, essentially, uh, give us a hundred dollars a year, uh, and you get to use the Wi-Fi, and you know what I mean. Like it's you're a member of the club, but the perks aren't anything that cost them any money, actually, or much at least. Um, and that's worked very well for them. Uh, hmm. I, it has. I, it has. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's other bookstores that do that. I think Kepler's maybe also does that. Um, I, I, well, a, I know more and more yeah. Patreon memberships you need, your own book club well, things that's that what I was going to, guaranteed yeah, yeah. recurring income right right seem and, and, to be the the only way yeah. otherwise it's right out of your pocket right otherwise right. you're closing right if you have staff right the other thing you can do is you can just be a an owner operator who doesn't uh have any employees which is most comic shops right true you know true. many many of them i mean yeah. you think if san francisco people when they were signing that ballot when they were voting for that measure, if they knew the effect it would have on the stores that they love in San right. Francisco and the things that they love about the retail scene in San Francisco, sure. that frankly is going away. Sure, sure. Um, do, you, do you think the outcome would have been the same? I do, because at that moment in time, the conversation was very much about corporate, you know, abuse of people, not, not small businesses, not curated businesses, not artisanal businesses, right? Um, and I think, I think that it came from a very good place. I don't think that anybody was trying to fuck with small businesses. You know, that's, that's not what that was about. Um, I do think that we didn't have an opportunity or even an ability to really make the counter argument, right? Because who wants to be the one going, yeah, but, but 
it, you know, you're going to hurt my business, right? Because in the macroeconomic point of view, well, your individual business doesn't matter in the macro. Sure. View, right. If you're transforming society and making it better. I actually think the most dangerous thing of, of our minimum wage law is not the fact that we went up to 15 and now 1539, but that we are guaranteed 100% for it to go up every single year until this law gets repealed by the CPI. And I understand why we put that in there, but there will be a point where it, before I retire, there will be a point where it will make more sense for me to get a job at McDonald's for minimum wage. I, I, absolutely. Business, and, you know, and would, would, I don't know, not to pick on anybody, but sure. Starbucks or whatever, a, a major corporation, they can absorb those kind of things mm -hmm. and can, they can even lose money on a location, right? If it's in San Francisco, if it's in Union Square, and it's like, this is a lost leader or whatever. I'm not saying that's right. what they do, but well, they, they can. can. Do it. They, they can up to a point. At some point, though, even, even big businesses. You oh, know, absolutely. I mean, I'm sure we're all noticing how you know, how like department stores are closing left and right. And that's because you can't afford to have 20 people on a floor anymore. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't make any fucking mathematical sense, you right. know? But then Even we're also you, driving those decisions of those sure. big corporations to install kiosks and robots sure. and all sure. these other things sure. that will edge out humans. Maybe. Um, we'll see. Maybe. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. I mean, I, uh, I, I would not be surprised if, if, you know, literally the death of retail happened in my lifetime, you know? Um, well, there are levers to pull, right? right? And I just feel when you take one as fundamental as wages mm -hmm. and, and, and wage flexibility, there's yeah. unintended consequences sure. that a lot of people are thinking about, but sure. most people have no clue. And even those people who are highly clued in sure. do not understand the realities of running a small sure. business anywhere, let alone San Francisco. Sure, so, but I, you know, at the same time, fun. at the same time, I fully agree that someone who's working 40 hours a week at Starbucks should be able to afford apartment, you know, in San Francisco. It's, you know, it's not, a, yeah. it's not a starter job at that point. You know, if you're a full-time worker at a place and you know, you should be able to do that. Uh, Cause those I, companies I, I have agree with you like symbolically, but I also go like, okay, well, if that's true, then the demand for those people will go up. They'll need to pay them more because you, if they're an essential sure part sure. of the business. So that's, that's just been a really, really, really difficult thing for me to wrap my head yeah. around. San Francisco is in particular is weird because, you know, like a lot of California, we refuse to build the housing that we need. Yes. Right. And so the rents just keep skyrocketing. Yes. And then the infusion of all the tech people in, yes. you know, uh, at Uber and, and, you know, all the companies downtown, Twitter, you know, people who are millionaires now because of stock vesting, and they can't afford to pay more. And so it just, there's this pressure that, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not sure who's going to serve all those millionaires at Uber their coffee 10 years from now. I, I just don't understand how that's going to happen, you know? Yeah, right. It's, it's, I, I honestly feel like, you know, we're seeing it happen. Money is like gravity. It's pulling people away from the Bay Area. It's sure. pulling some of the smartest people especially young people mm -hmm. away from the Bay Area, just because you, if you put it on paper, it just does not make sense. Right, right. Even if I could make a lot of money in the Bay Area and I probably could make a lot more money living there, it would all instantly get sucked up by cost sure. of living and mortgage and sure. everything else. So there's a big dynamic changing. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, okay. so to get back to the story, just cause I, let's finish the story. I'm ready. I'm at this meeting at, at Borderlands and the person who sat next to me, who's a customer who comes, we have a regular hangout beer night on Thursday nights. Uh, she uh, comes to that all the time. And she turned to me and she went, you know, Brian, if, if you just put a comic in my hand once a month, I totally buy it sight unseen. And like literally a little cartoon light bulb went the bing over my head i went huh huh okay and that's why we did the, the, the graphic novel of the month club www.graphicnovel.club.com slash start that's that's your plug um and where we pick up we curate a book every month uh everybody gets it we bring the writer the artist in there's a signed book plate yada 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 it's a really nice program that is is reinforcing art reinforcing creativity empowering my staff because my staff is are the ones who are who are voting on this we have a, and then after about a month of that 
uh, maybe, maybe not even, maybe it was the first month, um, a, a teacher who had signed up went, do you have one of these for kids? And another cartoon light bulb went off over my head like, sure, I've got one for kids. Why not? Uh, and then, you know, the kids one is the one that's growing the fastest. You know, the yeah. kids one grows 25%, 50% faster than the adult one does. Uh, and if you get 10% of those kids interested, I mean, a percentage of those kids will be interested in mainstream comics or whatever yeah. that comics experience has to offer. Yeah. And man, you made this smart move. Not, I mean, not just the dollars of, oh, that easy kid money. It's sure. an investment in the culture sure. and in your customer base and in sure. everything else. It is one of the smartest moves I've, I've seen. Yeah. I, I didn't think it would work when I saw, when I saw you announce it. Like, I, I, I didn't know how many people you could get to do that. I know. I agree. I didn't either. I, there's just no way to know. But it, it's, it's worked out. I mean, we have, we have roughly 250 members of each awesome. of the two clubs. Uh, and, and, you know, particularly with the kids clubs, I mean, I'm getting parents who are like, you know, we, the whole family, when the book comes, we sit down and we look at it and it becomes like a thing. Like they're, yes. they're actually interested in, in I, I, I don't know. I love it. And, and, and it increases, you know, these kids are making regular visits to the store now and they usually buy two or three other books at the same time. Of course, right? Of you course. know, and the parents are like, the kids are reading. They want to read. They don't want to touch the pros, man. They, you know. They oh, they they love the comics. Let's go for it, you know. Uh, so it it's really it's really got this kind of virtuous feedback loop. Absolutely, know? kids that read comics are kids that love reading. That's yep, always Absolutely. been my feeling. Absolutely. Brian, you've done that. I mean, that program alone. If that's all you did, mm. then um, you've done some really cool stuff. But man, I'm just gonna real quickly just say thank you for so many of the things that you've done, starting with. Let's go to the Marvel lawsuit. I, we don't have to go into the details of that. Let's just say they, the publisher Marvel was doing wrong to the retailers. They lied. You called them on it. You sued them on it. You put thousands of dollars back in the pockets of retailers. Right. Right. That alone yeah. puts you on my route, Mount Rushmore. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, the, the worst part, not the worst part, because the result ended up being really good. But like the whole lawsuit thing totally didn't have to happen. You know, I, I tried for months to resolve this without suing them. You know, I, I, the last fucking thing anybody wants to do is to file a lawsuit, uh, especially a class action lawsuit. It is so much work. It is so much time, but, but they just wouldn't listen, you know, and, and it, and the thing about it, it was so clear cut they literally broke their terms of sales. There was no right. ifs, ands, or buts about it. It clearly said, we will make these books returnable if, right. and then they didn't, you know? Right. And, and originally, I thought we were talking about like 15 or 20 comics. And then we get into discovery, and it's like, oh no, it's 250 comics, or whatever the number was, you know? This preposterously long list. Like, if you had just, all you had to have done is go, oh, sure, we can, we'll take those 15 comics back. They, they, they would cost them $50,000 at most, and it right. said it cost them a million dollars plus their lawyer's legal fees. And how much of that, and, and, and I'm guessing a lot, if not most of the money went to the lawyer. I mean, that's how class actions work, right? They get a big chunk of the money, and, and a lot on, of it goes. On our side, no. So, so there was a million dollars that was split among the retailer group. That there was an additional amount of money that was paid to my lawyers. Okay. I, I think it was like a hundred fifty or two hundred thousand, something like okay. that. You Great. know, um, but it wasn't. It wasn't like the lawyers soaked it all up. Like we structured it so that retailers got their money back first and foremost. Okay. So tell me if this is right. I'm trying to connect some dots here. Yeah. To what I think is during my tenure in comics the most transformative and important thing to happen to the industry was the final order cutoff. I don't know if but you agree with that. I, I, I fundamentally agree. And final order cutoff is a direct result of this because Marvel didn't want to ever bother with returns. Right. And so they decided, and I, I honestly think that this was a spiteful move, that this was not them thinking out what it meant. Yeah. I think that they went, well, fine, if you're going to act like that, then, then no information is accurate until three weeks before, like two days before we, 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 we print the orders. So that's, that's your final time. That's the actual information. And, but it actually turned out to be the best thing because, because it shrunk our window from being 
two months roughly, uh, maybe as much as 10 weeks, down to three weeks uh, of having, you know, kind of our, our balls on the line, you know? It, it transformed um, the way I ordered comics. Yep. It transformed the, 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 all of the calculations I did on comics. Sure. In some ways, it might have led to this titles getting like rapidly canceled because the final order cutoff is that much more. But in my mind, that's a good thing, right? That's sure. an increase in the evolutionary process. Sure. Um, but to I me, mean, I, I, you know, I think, yeah. I think there are current, currently there's certainly some problems. Uh, for example, publishers adding covers at, at final oh order gosh. cutoff. So we literally have, I mean, we're guessing way more than we ever did in the past. My solution there is just fuck those books. I don't order that stuff. You know, yeah, you don't want to play the game the right way. I don't want to play either. But there are there are publishers manipulating and using FOC. This this week we just turned in an entire month's worth of DC acetate covers in a single week. In one week we had to you know, and it's two months out. So I feel like that's an abuse of FOC. I mean. I understand why they did it because they did the same thing the last time they did fancy covers, but it, it's an abuse of the system. And it, and right, it's they're finding it, their know. ways around that. Check, yeah. And to me, that was always just a signal. Like if this is a yeah. weekly series, yeah. I really do not have to care that much because you guys yeah. obviously don't care. Although, yeah. not to get too current, but you know, House of X, Powers of X, that sort of shifted it. I, 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 I know your feelings, I read your feelings, I know sure. your feelings on weekly comics, but I felt I feel like this one in particular, because it is not your throwaway weekly right. Avenger series, sure. Sure. it's bringing people into the store. How do you feel about that? I th that part of it creatively, creatively, the book is a monster. Creatively, that's the best superhero comics have been, probably in a decade. You know, um, I'd probably go, but I'd probably go back to All Star Superman as the last thing that I've mm -hmm. you know kind of enjoyed that much and actually got what the characters were about. Right. Um, but you know, mechanically, as an ordering process, it's still fucked up. I mean, here we are at week eight, I want to say, and I still have no idea how, how many copies to order. You know, it, it's just random crapshoot. Because of the way that comics ship and because of the way reorders happen and because many of the people buying hawks and pox at my store are doing so because they couldn't find it at a different store. Yes, yes. Not because they're going to keep shopping at my store. Yes. And, and I'm really, 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 really worried about Dawn of X and these six books, only one of which is by Hickman. Like, what's going to happen there and how do we order that? All of the profit that I'm making right this second could be just swept away in a second if that does not do, you know, as well. Well, I'm going to say this, Brian. If anybody's going around all the stores in San Francisco mm. and looking for a book and finding it at your book, or even not finding it at your store, right. they're going to have that chance to look around your store and they're going to compare it and they're going to know and they're going to come back there and you're going to get a customer because that's the kind of store that you have. Well, I mean, I, I, I intellectually, I think that's, I, and I like the compliment, thank you. But I also think that if you're coming in because you, you're, you read X-Men or watched the cartoon show 20 years ago and you haven't read comics in in the meantime, and you read some sort of glowing article about how great this one X-Men comic is, if you walk into the store and you can't find that one X-Men comic, it doesn't matter what else they have, you're True. probably not gonna be a satisfied customer. Well, maybe, but you have stuff that you could turn uh, them on to. I know you would. Sure, I just, I, it is, it, there is a significant downside to the way that Marvel chose to publish this and not mitigate our risk in the right way okay they, they could have I, overshipped they could have they could have shared the book with us they could have given us pdfs they chose not true to, true you know they, they they could have overshipped they could have made it returnable they could have done things that would have got the copies into the marketplace uh they could have overprinted because they knew what they had that's the thing they knew what a good comic it was because they got to read it as it was being done right if I was working at Marvel and I read House of X 2, I would have been quintuple the print run, flat out. Just do it, because we will sell every one of these copies and people will be thanking us because we did that. But right. they didn't do that. They, I mean, I'm sure they overprinted more than normal, but not to the degree that the work demanded, you know? This can, is a one I, in a generation work, you know? I, I, I'm, 
You know, I think they might have, like, I remember when the Brubaker X-Men stuff came out too, and I right. sort of felt that way. And I was like, I'm going to go really strong. This is going to be transformational. And it right. sort of wasn't. Mm. Um, so I, I, when this first came out, I was like, this is a chance. I love it. I like Hickman. I think this is interesting. Right. It wasn't a lock for me for sure until that right. reveal. This yeah, kind it was of the real. Yeah. Reveal. Yeah. yeah. No, I agree. That's why, that's why I used two as my example. Yeah, that's uh, real. That was a really hard one. But yeah. I love it that it's got people thinking and talking about comics. As far as my videos and my show, like my, the House of X stuff, that's what people want to watch. Right, right, no right. offense. There's going to be less watch, people watching this. Who but wants to listen to me? But it's going to be the right people, Brian. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, okay, so I have uh, uh, just one, one other piece here. So um, in regards to uh, – the future of retailing and crowdfunding. I just want to hear the Hibs take on Kickstarter and, and does that work with comic stores? Is it fundamentally at odds? Is it a replacement for the direct market perhaps? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's potentially a replacement. Uh, so at the end of the day, I, there are very few Kickstarters that are generating what I would call a real, success right there's like a you know check please you know ngozi made i don't know a million fucking dollars off that you know and and she's set for life which is fantastic but but most people well and, and you know what part of it is too is that most creative people aren't business people right so yes. so most of them are going i i just want to i want to do my comic and i want to sell some copies oh i've got i've got 500 people who who kickstarted it i'll print 800 copies you know, and, and not realizing, well, but then what happens? Like, what? that's great for this month, maybe even this year. But how do you, how does that help you? Because the, the money in comics, I think, is, is in books that have been in print for 30 years. Yes. You know? Neil Gaiman's still getting a check every goddamn month for Sandman. I mean, he's getting checks for yeah. other things, too. But he's, you know, Mike Dringenberg probably lives at all because he gets a check from Sandman every month, you know? Um, Are you ready for those checks to explode and for your business to explode when the Sandman Netflix series drops, Brian? Yeah, yeah, I am. I think that'll be great. Well, I mean, if, if, if the show's any good, the show probably suck. Um, but so I, so I think that, I think that most crowdfunding isn't, isn't to leverage the crowd to then make your book a success. It's to capture those dollars in the short term and not to have a long-term success. Yeah. And the fact that most of those get kept out of the direct market, yeah. I feel is like a, you're not putting it in front of the people that are most likely to want comics. Sure. The other, but the other part of it, right, is that, is that when you crowdfund, you're taking the biggest fans out of the yeah, economic exactly. ecosystem, right? And so that's really tricksy, right? Like I've I've tried a couple of Kickstarter books, like, you know, where I buy into the, you know, buy five copies and get the retailer discount. And they never sell. Yeah. They ne they're, and they look like good books, but that's because all the people who want them already bought them direct from yeah. the artist, yeah. you know? Right. Uh, it's, and, it's and got really, perks for that. Sure, and got exactly. that warm, fuzzy feeling sure. for supporting the artist it's, directly. So where I'd say it where I'd say it works is that is that rare kind of project like a check please you you know check please right yes the, I haven't read it I'm familiar yeah, so it's so it's a it's a gay relationship comic about hockey players one of whom really likes baking and like that would not work in the traditional market right like if they or that was in previews you'd go I, I'm not even gonna order that, right right. But she found this whole audience outside of comics and then it got picked up by first second because they saw what the potential there was, right? So for that kind of thing where you make, where you're, you're finding an audience that is not going to be served in the comic shops, right? But if you're doing your version of a superhero comic, just conservative, I mean, there's an audience that, that's the comic shop audience, right? right. That's, you're, there's no other audience than that. Uh, and so you're just, you're just removing yourself from the ecosystem. And I don't think that's the way to go myself. 
What, what I've always thought is I've wondered, like, and we've seen it happen a little bit where the superstars of comics from mainstream publishing put out their own and try to capture their fan base and pull it into something that they, that they could totally control. Mm -hmm. And, and, and like you said, most of them are not businessmen. So, or business people, sorry. And uh, so that they, they, one, maybe they'll have a successful book, but they don't know how to capitalize that and turn that into a publishing venture because that's not what they do. Sure. Um, Sure. And we can also, you know, we can also look at like real world people who try to do it. Now, some of them, have had success, like the Veronica Mars movie, I guess, made a bunch of money for them. But, you know, I always think about uh, when Stephen King serialized a book. And, and, and at the end of it, he went, that, that was stupid. I'm never doing that again. Right. I made a whole lot less money than I would have if I had just published it through a publisher, you know? Right. Because, because these structures exist to publish things to, to market them, to, to move them, to design them, to yes. edit them. There's a whole business and infrastructure. There's retail stores. The direct market is 24, 2,500 dedicated, passionate believers in the medium. Why would you not want them hand selling your book? Why would you want to be outside of that market? That makes no sense to me. Now I get it if you're like, yeah, but I'm doing gay hockey players. They don't want that, you know, sure, right? But that's not what most comics are uh, that are getting kickstarted. How, how's is, that book selling off the shelf for you? Uh, Check Please actually sells pretty well. We actually picked that as one of our graphic novel of the month club uh, picks as well. Uh, and again, people loved it once they, once they saw it, you know? It's the kind of thing that people were saying, I, I would never have picked this up off the shelf and, and bought it. Oh, but it's actually really, really good. Wow, thank you. You know, I mean, that's the great part about the Grab Novel Club is, is turning people onto books that, you know, I, I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have bought this. And yet it was one of the best things I've ever read. You know, I'm amazed. Sorry, I, didn't, that I didn't mean to make that a plug again. No, that wasn't what I was trying to do. <laughs> I, I'm amazed at the high level quality of that, of, of that scene, the comics. Mm-hmm. It's obviously people that grew up reading the masters and not just the superhero stuff. They read their Scott McClouds and they read their manga and they read their everything. And that stuff is synthesizing into this whole new wave of comics that is just fantastic. Brian, yeah. you're at the head of that curve. You've always <laughs> been there. I try. Yeah. You, you've always been there. You've always had tons of advice most of it awesome mm. the occasional one that i took oh, and went sure. the other way right but who doesn't of course. no but it, i'm i'm no one's ever always right you know yeah well there's one guy i want to mm. talk about for a second okay he All wasn't right. always right but you wasn't and I always right knew him very yeah. well yeah both yeah. learned a lot from him. let's talk yeah. for a second this will we'll, this will be we'll wrap this up soon but yeah. this will i want to talk a little bit about uh, a guy we both knew named Rory Root. Can you yeah. tell me how you met Rory yeah. and, and who he was oh, maybe? So, well, yeah, I mean, the how I met him. So we, we uh, there was a chain of comic shops uh, here in the Bay Area uh, that had multiple locations. And uh, I was working and eventually became the manager of the San Francisco uh, branch. And Rory was man- working and eventually became the manager of the Berkeley branch. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, both of us were not a fan of the boss and both of us thought we could do a better job on our own. Uh, Rory got there two years before I did. Um, but of course, Rory was also a couple years older than I was. Uh, uh, and, you know, he was my best friend in comics uh, by far. Um, you know, he, he was the guy that at two o'clock in the morning, because I knew he would be up at two o'clock in the morning because the man drank fucking 50 cups of coffee that were this big every right. single day. Uh, you know, and I, I just like, oh, I had this thought about comics. He would be the person I would call. And, and then, you know, we talk for two hours. Uh, uh, I, I always thought that that comic relief was, I mean, you, you were saying very nice things about this store. Now, Comic Relief was was the aspirational for me. That was Mecca. Uh, Mecca was was there. Well, it uh, was for me too. I mean, in many ways, but I also just looked at it like something that I couldn't pull off. I couldn't achieve. Mm. I couldn't achieve out of the gate, and like to sure. get there, I look. I go like this takes decades to get sure. this, and I don't know if I ever can. Sure. And what I learned later was I'm not sure that it, how sustainable that that yeah no no i would i in fact i you know when we were saying he didn't do everything right no i mean i the the business model was not 
if he had the minimum wage that we do now, he that comic relief would not exist. I, I, yeah. I, I believe. And he also, you know, if he had one fault, Rory Root, it was that he he never met a book that he didn't want to hoard. And so you would you would walk into his store and there would be nine copies of some obscure thing on the shelf that literally had a layer of dust on them. And I'd be like, Rory, why don't you blow out six of these nine, right? And, and just get, get your money back on them. It's like, no, because someday I'll sell them. And I mean, he was probably technically right, someday he would sell them, but you can't hold on to things for, for a decade to, to, to just, you know, make cover price back. You know, it doesn't, it, it, that's the, it doesn't, it doesn't work, you know? Well, that's the difference between the passion, fully passionate sure. comic store, sure. right? And the fully practical comic book store. Yeah. And I think all stores are in that continuum. Yeah. Somewhere, like I would put yeah. Rory fully on the passion side. I would put yours more than 50% on the passion side. I, I, just in the sense of there are things I know that you stock in your store that are not turning the numerical amount of yeah. times <laughs> yeah. to justify their spot in your store, right? Yes, so, but but they're for the medium, and so I stock them because that's that's it's important to do that, you know. And they're for you yeah. because you love the medium and you recognize the sure. quality in them, and you want that sure. in your store. So sure. that was the that was what tore me in half in yeah. comics, you know, yeah. like. Man, I wanted to sell Reed Fleming World's Toughest Milkman, and I wanted to sell yeah. more fanographic stuff, and I wanted yeah. to sell all this yeah. stuff that I saw at Hibbs's store and I yeah. saw at Rory's store. Yeah, and, and I just, but the thing is, is, I knew that Rory was struggling financially always, you know, yes. and so, and so that was why I was like, well, sell some, get rid of the stuff that, you know, don't get rid of all of it, just get rid of some of it, and it'll be great, and then you'll have money. And then you'll be happier, and then you maybe you won't smoke 14 packs of cigarettes a day <laughs> and eight cups of coffee, which, you know, ultimately is what killed him, you know? For I sure. Mean, at the end of the day, that's what, that's what killed him. Uh, and I, I, I miss him every day. I, it, he, he was my best friend in comics, and he, he was an aspirational guide for me, you know, I, 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 I'm sorry he didn't take care of himself. I should have said this, done this up front, but explain to me Rory and the book trade and just what, what he meant to comic book store. You know what I'm trying to say here. Right. Like, well, you're, you, you were trying to say that I was on top of it. No, man, I was, I was like third place compared to Rory. Rory knew all, I, Rory had all this stuff figured out 15, 20 years ago. He totally saw where it was going to go. He had totally figured out back then oh no no buy direct from the book publishers and you know and you can save a whole you know you can make a lot better decisions doing that um yeah no no he had he had figured that out long 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 ago he just hadn't figured out exactly how to make the business model part of it work yes right yes. but he knew he could see this if he i like to think that he's looking down going yeah you, you that's the way it's supposed to be kid you know I I think that his, I, I think while he wasn't what we would call the ultimate comics business person, I will say though, how long he was there in Berkeley in a high traffic retail spot yep. and being able to make that move to the store yep. that he did, even though we all know that was sort of on like shaky footing from the get go. Yep. I was just amazed that he could pull that off, that he could pull off the the size of the staff, that he yep. could pull off the the yearly San Diego trips yep. Yep. where he set up one of the best comic book stores in the country on the floor of the San Diego Comic Con yep. and exposed hundreds of thousands of people no I mean millions of people perhaps to sure. a vision of comics and books that yep. they just couldn't see anywhere else yep and that's all gone now you know I mean that's that if you've been to San Diego lately it's there's that's all gone now you know, there's yeah, nobody even Bud trying Plant to do. pulled out. Bud Plant yep. was like the last refuge of what I would see at, of a Rory store. Like yep. the highest quality material presented in copious quantities, right? Yep. Like a, an, yep. a, an amazing thing. Yep. Man, I miss the guy too. Yeah. Um, in many ways, it was him dying that made me reassess like what I could do in comics retailing and where mm -hmm. I needed to get to. And when mm -hmm. I was his age, mm -hmm. 
could I be as successful even as he was? Mm -hmm. And if I was, what would that mean to me in the Bay Area in the 21st mm -hmm. century? You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. guy was an inspiring figure, a cautionary example, and yep. just a hell of a guy to talk comics with. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, no, you could, you could talk for hours and hours and hours with him, and, and it never grew tired. Yeah. Well, I mean, I like I said, every day I miss that guy. You know, yeah. Well, me too, Brian. And man, I really appreciate you taking just even this amount of time to talk comics sure. and comics retail with me because there's nobody who's got the kind of like um, retail insights as well as the, is in line with me artistically as far as what comics can okay. be and what they do. Like I have not met too many people outside of yourself and Rory and Jim Hanley. Joe Field. Joe Field, Joe Field, he's an upcoming interview coming soon. We're going to talk about Rory. We're going to talk about retail and what they did. Joe is a, Joe is a different thing to me. Sure. Joe is marketing and, 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 and love and passion for just his community in general and people yeah. in general. So I can't wait to talk to him. I, yeah, think I, I certainly, I certainly hate people myself. So, you know. Well, me and you are more from the curmudgeon side, I think, than the Joe feel a little bit more, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Brian, but Look, I, I always, I'm I always say, I always say this store would be the greatest place in the entire universe if only it wasn't for the goddamn customers. <laughs> that is That's a perfect a way. To, That's a joke. That is a perfect way to end it because it is a joke, but we know there's a kernel of truth in all of that. I used to feel the same way sometimes. Man, thank you so much. Truly, I appreciate everything you've done for the industry. And for me personally, uh, like you made a big difference in showing what a comic book store could and maybe should be. Okay. Um, so thank you, Dan. I, I, I appreciate Thank you for the kind words. You know, I, it just, everybody does their best, I think, you know, so. They do, man. And, and, and you're one of the good ones. You're fighting the good fight and, and keep doing it. I really appreciate it. And thank you so much uh, for participating in this. My pleasure. Thank you.